to this. Uh, good evening to all those in India, and uh, good morning to all those who have joined us from Cambridge and other parts of the United Kingdom or Europe for that matter. My name is Lakshak Dhawan, and I'm a research fellow at the Center for Legal Policy. I welcome you all to this webinar on directors' responsibilities in financially troubled times. We are very honored to have two special guests joining us today, Professor Felix Tepic and Mr. Suhar Sena. Let me begin by introducing our panelists to you all. Professor Felix Tepic is a professor of law at the University of Cambridge and senior member of Newnham College, University of Cambridge. At the Faculty of Law, he serves as the director of the Center for Corporate and Commercial Law, which is also known as PCL, and director of International Strategy and Partnerships. He has been awarded a very prestigious James Neese Fellowship in Financial Economics by the University of Cambridge. His research areas include corporate finance law, insolvency law, and artificial intelligence. He has advised many international organizations, governments, parliaments, and courts in these areas. Most importantly, he was a professor when I was a student at the university. Welcome, Felix. Yeah. Um... Many many thanks, Dax. It's, it's it's great to see you again. You know, uh, after seeing you, of course, at Cambridge um, a, a while ago, and I'm I'm very pleased to be invited um, and, and contribute today. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, we also have Mr. Suhar Sena. He's a structured finance, restructuring, and insolvency partner at KZB and Partners, Mumbai. He regularly advises resolution professionals, creditors, and bidders in the insolvency process. He also advises credit funds on fair debt investments and the uh, trading of secondary debt. Some notable matters he worked on include the resolution of DHSL, Bushin Steel Limited, Reliance Capital, and Jet Airways. Interestingly, he was a research assistant to the Bank Directory Law Reform Committee, which advised on drafting the insolvency in Bank Directory Court 2016. So he was qualified to practice law in three jurisdictions, namely India, England and Wales, and the state of New York. Welcome, Suhash. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it's it's always a pleasure to come back and speak to events organized by Vidhi. I have a real soft corner for Vidhi. Uh, spent countless nights mm -hmm. uh, in the Vidhi office with Dibanshu when we were, you know, assisting in drafting the bankruptcy code. So I have the fondest memories and I have great respect for the work that Vidhi has been doing. So thank you. And real honor to be uh, you know, on the same platform as Professor Felix. His reputation precedes him. So thank you very much for the for the honor. Thank you, Suhash. I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to all our attendees once again. Before we start, let me just set the context for this discussion. Uh, all of us know that a corporation life cycle is divided into three stages of phases. The first one is solvency stage, which is characterized by cash reserves, minimal debt, and consistent profits. The second one is borderline insolvency stage, which is also known as the twilight zone. It's a very interesting area. It's a very, it's a gray area because sometimes it's difficult to determine when it commences. It is generally marked by dwindling reserves, uh, marginal profits, and rising debt. The third one is the insolvency stage, which is defined by severe financial deterioration, inability of a company to meet its debt obligations, and potential bankruptcy as determined by the existing legal frameworks of a country. So as a corporation progresses from one stage to another, there is a shift in the primary set of duties of directors. Section 166 of the Companies Act of the Indian Companies Act 2013 lists the fiduciary duties of these directors. Similarly, in the UK, uh, the duties of directors are enshrined in Chapter 2 of Part 10 of the UK Companies Act 2006. The fundamental duties, which are more or less the same in both jurisdictions, owed to the corporation in general are the duties of care and loyalty. Uh, so, the duty of care requires the director to exercise proven judgment and reasonable care, and the duty of loyalty requires the director to act in good faith. It is well settled that uh, the duties are owed to the shareholders during the solvency stage of a corporation. However, when a company faces financial distress or struggles to meet its debt obligations, its directors are required to strike a delicate balance between competing interests of various stakeholders including creditors and others, while upholding their fiduciary duties. Creditor, uh, debtor, uh, directors also have to bear the consequences if they're found to be in breach of these duties. So this whole scenario gives rise to various questions. For instance, when does the beneficiary of these duties change? What personal liabilities can be imposed on these directors? What safeguards are available to these directors? We intend to unpack all these questions and many more during the course of this discussion by analyzing the existing frameworks in the United Kingdom and India. 
we will also suggest some policy reforms to strengthen the director accountability system. Uh, for our attendees, please note that if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat box. We will try to answer as many as we can in the end. So I'll start with Felix. Uh, Felix, uh, uh, two questions. One is, uh, what even triggers uh, this shift in director's duties as per the UK law? And uh, is it appropriate to say that borderline insolvency stage triggers reorientation of focus from shareholders to creditors? Yeah, so thank you very much, very much, uh, Dutch, for the for the introduction. Um, and allow me before I go into the you know detailed answers um, on your questions, I'd like to set the scene a little bit in terms of describing the commercial and and, and legal background. Um, so what gives rise to the problem that we're discussing uh, today? Um, so in this first part of our discussion, we are focusing on the phase where. Um, there is already financial distress, but the company has not yet entered a formal insolvency proceeding. So we are particularly interested in this twilight zone and why we are actually interested in perhaps modifying the duties of directors. Now, the important background to this is, is, financial, uh, is limited liability. And that is that both the shareholders' liability uh, for creditor claims is limited but also, if you look at it functionally, the director's uh, liability for shareholder claims as a starting point is limited. So why is this? Um, for example, in the United Kingdom, uh, Section 3 of the Companies Act says there's limited liability for shareholders. But also, if you look at directors, then they also enjoy something that is functionally very similar. And why is that? It is because if directors act in their capacity as directors and they act for the company, then they're usually not liable for contracts and they're usually not liable for torts. So for example, in the UK, that is based on the case of Williams and Natural Life. Now, this remains the case in financial distress. And in addition to this, there's usually an unholy alliance between shareholders and directors uh, in terms of governance rights that gives rise to these problems. And, and why is that? Shareholders appoint directors, they remove directors. And that means that directors often act in the interests of shareholders and not in the interests of directors. Now in financial distress, this leads in combination to with limited liability to a happiness to take risks because directors and shareholders are both downside protected. So if things go wrong, they are not liable. And so they prefer risk-taking um, over creditor interests. They prefer private benefits over creditors' interests. And um, But one thing to, to just as a side note to note that sometimes in financial distress, actually there may be a difference between directors and shareholders' interests. And that is that um, perhaps you know, directors are sometimes entering into new coalitions with rescue uh, finance providers rather than the old shareholders who are out. Now, the problem that we are discussing today is caused by the fact that even once the assets do not cover the debts anymore, the governance that I've described remains in place. So even if the shares have a value of zero, the shareholders continue to appoint and remove directors and they can give directions to directors and directors may tend to act in their interest. That means shareholders' interests, not creditors' interests. However, if we now turn to an economic analysis of what is actually going on here, then the creditors are now what we call the residual claimants. What is a residual claimant? A residual claimant is the last person who has an economic claim on the assets of the company, but that is a variable economic claim. So why is that? If the debts, if liabilities exceed the assets, then uh, the shareholders are out of the money. Now, because creditors usually get paid first, it's the creditors' assets that are actually in play. Now, if the, the value of the company rises again, that means assets increase again, then the creditors get paid more. That means there are the residual claimants, they get last, but also in the phase where liabilities exceed assets, they are residual in the sense that what they get is variable. And why does that matter to us? It matters to us because the residual claimant is the person 
who has the best interest and the strongest interest that things are done well because they benefit immediately of what is happening. So in financial distress, when liabilities exceed assets, the shareholders are not the residual claimants anymore, but the creditors are. And by way of starting point, we would usually attribute decision rights to the residual claimant, because as explained, the residual claimant is the one who has the strongest interest to do things well. However, as a starting point, this is not what our legal orders do. Instead, as long as uh, a formal insolvency proceeding is not commenced, the shareholders, who are not residual claimants any longer, remain in power. They give instructions, they appoint, and the directors will follow their orders. And this is actually the background against which we now start considering whether the legal order should now transform or amend the director's duties, which are usually owed to the company in the interest of shareholders, to now say, now these duties are owed in the interest of creditors. So that kind of sets the scene. And I'll come back later to the residual claimant principle, but it's a really important starting point. But we will see it may need modification. So what is going on in the UK now, you know, turning to, to, to statute and doctrine? Uh, the starting point is section 172 of the Companies Act, where we can read that um, directors of a company must act in the way that they consider in good faith would be most likely to promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members as a whole. And members as a whole means shareholders, and that is what applies in solvency. And now the question arises whether this shall be modified in financial distress. And here we have a really important case, and that is BTI uh, 2014 and Sequana. Now that is a Supreme Court decision uh, rendered in 2022. It is a really significant decision for the law of director's duties. Now there for the first time, the UK Supreme Court has considered circumstances in which directors can be liable for failing to take into account the interests of creditors. And the Supreme Court did so, confirming the Court of Appeals 2019 decision. Now, what the Supreme Court did there was to affirm a line of common law cases that had been developed before in this area, starting with West Mercia Safety Wear in the 1980s. And these, line, these, these cases have held that directors are actually required to begin taking creditors' interests into account where insolvency looms. Now, this, uh, the Supreme Court decision in Sequana is also really noteworthy because it confirms that the UK has departed from positions in other common law uh, jurisdictions, including Delaware and Canada, um, that have declined to impose an equivalent duty. Now, what is the duty? In summary, what the Supreme Court decided was that the case law based duty to consider the interests of creditors arises when creditors know or ought to know that the company is insolvent or bordering on insolvency. And insolvent in this context means cash flow or balance sheet insolvent. And this is in line with the statutory tests in the Insolvency Act, and that is section 123. Now, the knowledge requirement has later been confirmed in case law, such as Hunt and Singh in 2023, and that can be actual or const constructive knowledge. Now, when an insolvent liquidation or insolvent administration is in inevitable, then the directors must treat the interests of creditors as paramount. That, that is also something the Supreme Court had decided. Now, what the Supreme Court rejected is that directors need to consider the interests of creditors when there's merely a risk of insolvency. Instead, the court preferred the requirement of imminent insolvency or the probability of insolvent liquidation. Now, what is the content of the duty? Um, as mentioned, there's a line of cases starting with West Mercia, and these cases, including a case uh, called Roberts and Froelich, have confirmed that both the duties of loyalty and the duty of care has to be um, targeted now at the, at the creditor's interest. Now, what Sequana held was that require, uh, the directors are now required to conduct a balancing act between taking into account the interests of creditors 
and the interests of shareholders in deciding corporate actions. And that process involves an ongoing assessment of the financial situation of the company. Now, as the company's solvency deteriorates, then the interests of the creditors must have more weight under that decision, and in particular where they conflict with shareholders' interests. And following Hunt and Singh, the 2023 case, this is a sliding scale. So this means that there's no automatic breach once the duty is engaged. Instead, it is a weighing exercise. So one action may breach the duty, such as paying out dividends, such as no assets, no assets are left, whereas other decisions, such as continuing to trade, risking further losses, may actually not be in breach of that duty. Uh, just to mention to those who are particularly interested, uh, the survival of common law or the relevance of common law is expressly stated in the Companies Act under section 172, uh, subsection 3, so that, uh, that expressly says that such common law duties protecting creditors are still relevant, even though we now have a statutory regulation of directors' duties in, uh, in uh, the Companies Act. Now, I think I'd, I'd like to leave it there, uh, and, and forgive me for speaking a bit longer, but I wanted to set the scene both in terms of uh, commercial interests, economic issues, and uh, the law that applies, noting that there are other duties and other liabilities affecting directors. I'm just starting to explore the change of sh uh, duties um, that directors owe to the company. Right, right. Thank you, Felix. Thank you so much for giving us this background. This was really helpful. So I'm going to borrow a lot from what Felix said and ask my ask Suhar some questions. So are creditors consider residual payments in India as well? And also is completely disregarding the interest of shareholders advisable, especially in the case of uh, voluntary CIB filing under Section 10 of the IBC, Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code? Thanks for that, Dr. So I think um, what Professor Felix has said is a very good starting point to compare our regime. And as he was speaking, there are two things which really sort of strike me is first of all, the duty of care that directors have, the scope of the duty of care that directors have under Section 166 of the Indian Companies Act compared to Section 172 of the UK Companies Act. So under the Indian Companies Act, the, the object, the duty of the directors is, is primarily owed to the members of the company, but there's also a duty owed to the company as well as its employees, stakeholders, the community and the environment. Now, if you look at Section 172 of the of the UK Companies Act, that seeks to uh, have more of a uh, an enlightened shareholder value sort of a regime, where the duty is imposed only insofar as it's concerned with the members of the company. However, there is a sort of a secondary duty, which is uh, that when you're acting in the best interest of the, of the members of the company, you must have regard to certain other you know categories of stakeholders. So India adopted the, the pluralistic stakeholder model as opposed to you know, the enlightened shareholder value model when it comes to imposing duties on directors. Now, why that is interesting is because the broader community that the Indian Companies Act refers to, which is the, you know, the employees and, and, and environment and so on, notably creditors are missing over there. Okay? And this is the Companies Act of 2013, which is three years before the bankruptcy court came along. Second important distinction is that section 172 sub clause 3, as Professor Felix pointed out, says that the duty to the members of the company is moderated by or modified by any other law which may impose a duty, a shifting duty towards creditors of the company. Point being that section 172 itself recognizes the common law duty and subsequently which was you know, codified under the bankruptcy court, the UK Insolvency Act, that your, your duty shifts from members to, to uh, uh, directors. Indian Companies Act does not have such change in duty. The first time that under Indian corporate law regime, we have a duty towards creditors of the company was after the bankruptcy court was enacted in 2016. And the provision that we have for uh, duty towards creditors of the company, in fact, borrows very heavily from the UK Insolvency Act wrongful trading provision with two or three slight modifications, which we will go into as, 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 as we discuss further. Um, so what this tells us is that for India, for the very long time, the shift of duty towards creditors was not a priority. And it has happened recently. 
as a result of which we don't have a lot of common law jurisprudence and neither do we have a lot of case law under the bankruptcy code because the bankruptcy code as i said is still a very recent legislation there was however a fraudulent um, uh, trading provision so in case under the old companies act where if directors were were trading continue to trade in a manner which had fraudulent intent or was fraudulent to certain sections of the company or outsiders then there was a penalty imposed so fraud which is a clear intent to commit fraud was explicitly recognized but wrongful trading where there is a shifting of duty and a duty to mitigate losses to creditors was never recognized now in this context there i think they also important to discuss two or three peculiar uh, practical aspects of of you know the indian legal system and, and our market one is again taking cue from what professor felix said that the directors are beholden to the shareholders right? because the shareholders appoint them and they have the right to remove them what i think makes that problem even more severe in india is that we don't have dispersed shareholding like we do in the uk so we have very concentrated shareholding in companies even including in listed companies which means that the promoter group or the controlling shareholder group inevitably has a very strong role in selecting and removing directors in fact very often the directors could be from the family of the promoter group which means that there is a greater incentive for the directors to continue acting in the best interest of the shareholders as opposed to the company or or directors as a whole so that's one i think important practical point of departure as far as our economy or generally generally how our company is set up second is the peculiar aspect of section 29a of our bankruptcy code which i'm not sure if professor felix is aware is essentially a section which says that in case you have defaulted and you suffer from certain disqualifications you cannot make, submit a restructuring plan for the insolvency of the company and those list of disqualifications are, are are quite long including if you were in charge of a company which was unable to pay its debts for a long period of time to the lenders so basically if for macroeconomic reasons for no fault of the company you have defaulted on your debt for about a year you will not be able to get back into your own company so that's another disincentive for directors who as i said are often proxies for the promoters to shift their duty towards creditors and 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 take any steps towards mitigating losses and the last thing i want to mention is the section on avoidable transactions so under indian law like in any insolvency law we have the concept of fraudulent preference undervalued transactions and so on now unlike in other jurisdictions where if uh, if there is evidence that such a transaction existed or such you know such matters were uh, entered into then it is the responsibility of the insolvency officer to take certain action in india in fact it is codified that the insolvency professional must investigate to find such transactions as opposed to in case he stumbles across it now obviously that is another disincentive for directors to voluntarily put the company into a bankruptcy procedure another interesting aspect is what do we mean by when the when the directors should be aware that there is no prospect of avoiding an insolvency now unlike the uk act where there is a twin test uh, you know you can look at the balance sheet test as well as the cash flow test under indian law it is a simple cash flow test which was initially uh, 100000 rupees now it's been increased to 10 million rupees or 1 crore rupees so the dilemma the directors face is that if there is a mere interest payment on which they are likely to be delayed or if they are not able to pay certain taxes or statutory dues or if they want a certain longer rope in when it comes to working capital from trade counter parties in these cases the company could well be delayed in its payment by more than a few weeks is that the starting point for the the directors duties to shift or does it have to be of such a grave nature that it is actually balance sheet insolvent and the net worth is negative now these are questions which have not yet been answered under indian law and what we will end up doing i i i i feel is looking up to uk companies act and the insolvency act and seeing the case law over there keeping in mind the fact that there are certain distinct very important distinctions uh, when it comes to imposition of duty and when the duty shifts um on the second question which daksh asked which is regarding section 10 now section 10 is basically the section under which the company can file for bankruptcy itself if it feels that you know it's it's defaulted and there's no reasonable prospect of reviving it the company itself can file for bankruptcy now what is very interesting is that when the bankruptcy court first came 
Section 10 could be invoked by the directors without having to go to the shareholders. So the directors could themselves take a call and put the company into a bankruptcy process. It was subsequently amended. And after the amendment, it requires a special resolution of the shareholders. So again, I think directors are put in a very tight spot. Even if you're a professional director with no ties with the promoters or with the shareholders who genuinely wants to take the company to bankruptcy because you know she feels so, she will not be able to unless she has shareholder consent. And shareholder consent, I think you all know, will be not be forthcoming. The only notable exception is a recent case called Go First, uh, which is a large airline case which went into bankruptcy. And what's interesting there is that, again, a very tightly controlled company by the promoters. What's interesting is that it went into bankruptcy. And now there are a bunch of directors who have filed cases in the bankruptcy court saying that the initiation of bankruptcy was fraudulent because the company could well have traded a little longer. So that's a very interesting dilemma where the duty of to has shifted towards creditors to protect creditors. But the creditors themselves are saying that, hang on, you could have actually survived a few months more and you could have actually cleared my dues. And now my dues cannot be recovered because a moratorium has been imposed. So that, that's, you know, just, just a lay of the land on how directors' duties are different in India and how the Companies Act views them differently and some peculiar aspects of uh, Indian law. Right, right, right. Uh, thank you so much. It, it is also important to highlight that uh, the IBC, the Insolvency Code that we have in India, explicitly acknowledges this share because we have adopted the creditor in control model as a, uh, opposed to the debtor in possession model that we have in the United Kingdom. So now this, uh, this has been explicitly acknowledged in our uh, jurisprudence, in our regime. So it's quite clear that the interest of uh, the creditors take precedence uh, over the interests of the shareholders during the borderline insolvency and insolvency stages. Now coming to the next pertinent question, uh, what happens when actors, uh, when directors act in breach of these duties? Or to be more precise, what liabilities or personal liabilities can be imposed on them when they engage in fraudulent or wrongful trading detrimental to the interest of writers? So Hurst in one of his articles stated that director's liability can be categorized into two main types. One is punitive, which are uh, civil uh, criminal penalties, and the other one is disgorgement based liability, which is a civil liability. Uh, punitive liability is largely codified and holds uh, directors accountable for intentional acts like fraud, uh, false representation to creditors, falsification of books and documents, etc. So it's important to highlight that in all these cases, some evidence of mens rea is important. So intention becomes an essential ingredient. However, uh, on the other hand, we also have disgorgement-based liability, which is the focus of attention in this, this, uh, of our discussion today. Uh, it involves meeting some interpretative standards or tests. So, Felix, uh, I'll come to you. I'll, uh, I would like to know more about the UK director liability framework. Uh, please allow me to abuse my privilege as the moderator, because I have a lot of questions regarding the liability framework you have in the United Kingdom. Uh, the first question is, what consequences can directors face if they ignore early warning signs of distress? and permit the company to carry on doing business while insolvent. And are there any policy recommendations you would suggest to fix uh, the fault lines in the director liability regime in the United Kingdom? Yeah, th thank you very much, uh, much uh, Dutch. Um, so first of all, so far, you know, when I introduced the, the, the UK law, I only, you know, focused on, you know, what maybe you can call now the Sequana uh, director's duty and if you're liable under that then um or if, you, if you're in breach of this then the director may be liable and uh, a liquidator or administrator may pursue that now in addition there are other rules a uh, statutory based and they are quite relevant well one of them is relevant the other is less so i'll start with the one that is less relevant but you know that still a rule that people talk about and hence a rule that i'd, I'd like to mention and that is uh, first uh, section 213 of the Insolvency Act 1986, fraudulent trading. Um, if, if you look into this, then we can read the following. Uh, if in the course of a winding up, it appears that any business of the company has been carried on with intent to defraud creditors of the company or creditors of any other person or any fraudulent purpose, then 
the liquidator may declare that any persons who are knowingly parties to the carrying on of the business in the manner that I just described are liable to make contributions to the company's assets as the court thinks proper. Now, this is called fraudulent trading. In addition to this civil sanction, there is a criminal uh, sanction. Um, that is, however, found in the Companies Act uh, 2006 in section 993. And under that, um, a, a director or other person can be uh, criminally convicted up to uh, 10 years in prison. Now, I'd like to focus in this context on the civil sanction, and that is section 213 of the Insolvency Act. And I'd like to say that in practice, it plays a very little role. Why is that? It is mainly due to the high threshold of intent. Or in other words, intention of defrauding creditors that is relevant for a creditor uh, sorry, for a director or other person to be held liable. And the courts have interpreted this not only to mean that someone is to blame, so mere blameworthiness is not sufficient, but actually this must involve actual dishonesty and knowing dishonesty. Um, and, and that then means, you know, looking at cases such as uh, Patrick Lyon, uh, and others, um, there's an old case, 1933, but still relevant here. Um, the threshold for intent, actual dishonesty is so high that, you know, if we look into practice, if we look into case law, we find very few cases under which directors are actually held liable under this rule. Now, why, why might one even be interested as an as, as a insolvency practitioner uh, in pursuing such a liability? It is because, you know, when I read it out, you saw that not just directors, but also third parties being involved in such fraud may be held liable. And that is an advantage that sometimes can be relevant in cases where the fraud is so obvious, the intent is very, very clear, and you want to bring someone third in, uh, into the liability, that you may turn to it. However, you know, there are very few cases reported, and also in practice, there are very few uh, cases turning on section 213. Instead, what is more relevant is something called wrongful trading. And wrongful trading is regulated in section 214 of the Insolvency Act 1986. Um, and just to kind of to read out the, the key parts of wrongful trading, um, a requirement is a winding up of the company or an administration. So now we need to be in a formal insolvency proceeding and what needs to happen is that the company went into insolvent liquidation or administration, and now comes the key part. Um, I cite uh, from section 214 to B, uh, saying at some time before the commencement of the winding up or the administration of the company, that person, that is our director, knew or ought to have concluded that there was no reasonable prospect that the company would avoid going into insolvent liquidation or entering insolvent administration. And it continues, and that the person was a director of the company at a relevant time. Uh, this uh, kind of knowing um, or, or ought to have known that there was no reasonable prospect of avoiding insolvent uh, liquidation or administration is some, sometimes also referred to as the point of no return. And it is interesting to know that what the law does here, is it actually describes the reason for liability as an expected procedure, right? So it says, if you ought to have known that insolvent liquidation or administration is inevitable, then you may be held liable. Um, so, so that is an interesting anchor, so to say, um, to, to say it is a procedure that um, is inevitable, uh, an insolvency, insolvency procedure, uh, and you ought to have known. Now, in terms of uh, in terms of the mental element, it is key here that we're actually looking at liability uh, in essence for negligence. And that makes this rule in wrongful trading uh, much more attractive than fraudulent trading. However, when I say much more attractive, I do not want to give the, the, the impression that wrongful trading is very, very common or is a rule that is very, very commonly applied in the United Kingdom. It is applied from time to time, but I would rather say it is um, more uh, 
a rarer or more ex exceptional incident that someone is actually held liable under this rule. And why is it? It is because maybe, you know, at the first reading, you might think, oh, we have here a, a rule that held, you know, holds uh, directors liable in case of insolvency. But actually, this point of no return, this threshold happens very, very late, or in other words, at a very, very bad state, financial state of the company. Because if we look into case law, then we, what we actually see is that courts require balance sheet insolvency in addition to cash flow insolvency, and this at a very, very deep state. That means the situation of the company has to be really, really hopeless in order for courts to apply liability. So just being in financial distress and knowing so will not necessarily trigger this liability. And here I'd like to turn a bit to our policy and why we do so. And I'd like to return to the residual claimant principle. And what I would like to explore is the interesting fact that most advanced jurisdictions, and even there's a strong trend in, in those jurisdictions that do not yet do so, apply liability to directors much later than the point in time in which the company's liabilities exceed the assets. Remember, if we look at the residual claim in principle, we would say, well, if the liabilities exceed assets, then the creditors are the residual claimants. And from that, we should conclude that if now directors do not act in uh, creditors' interest, they shall be liable. That would be a very strict and, and automatic application of the residual claimant principle, which is an economic principle. But we don't do so. Why do we impose liability much later than that? In other words, we allow the directors to trade in the state of economic financial distress, and we do not hold them liable. Only at a very, very late stage, when all hope is lost, then wrongful trading imposes liability. And the reason for that is that even though at this stage of financial distress, where the shares have a value of zero, the shareholders still have an upside interest. And that is if they manage to turn around the business, so if they manage to come back into solvency, then they benefit as then the next residual claimants. And because leaving them in control at the stage of slight financial distress generally has a stronger upside than immediately handing over control to creditors who would then usually say, well, then let's wind it up, wind it up and just pay us out. That is the reason why jurisdictions do impose such liability late. In other words, they give a breathing space to directors to try and restructure in financial distress, even though now liabilities exceed assets. And the reason for that is that generally, due to the interests of shareholders to come, come back into, into solvency, we expect for society as a whole better results than closing down things or holding directors liable immediately. And the reason is that the upside of shareholders is unlimited, whereas the upside of creditors is limited. And that explains why shareholders still have the better interests here. And that is why the reason is uh, creditors just want to get paid. If the, if the company is more successful, they still get paid the same sum. Shareholders are different. If the company is very successful, they get more. And that is why there is this peculiar or interesting deviation from a strict application of the residual claimant principle where we apply such liability quite late. Uh, so uh, I've spoken long enough, but I wanted to make that point because it is an interesting deviation from an economic principle that may speak at first look for, for, for uh, easier for uh, liability or for liability at lower thresholds, but instead we see the opposite with good reason. Right, right. Thank you, Felix. Uh, so much as far as Indian uh, law is concerned, this, di this director liability framework remains unclear. So should India adopt similar interpretations as UK courts for concepts like fraudulent and wrongful trading as uh, mentioned by Felix, given the similarities in uh, legal terminology? or explore uh, alternative interpretations? So I, I think the standards are quite similar, at least for fraudulent trading. 
and uh, the insolvency code does not define what fraud means in the context of the IBC. So, I mean, often when we are deal with this, we are, we are dealing with this problem in some of our cases. We have looked at how fraud is defined under other statutes. So, we have looked at, for example, the Companies Act, the Old Companies Act, where there's a similar provision. Uh, we have looked at the Indian Contract Act. And we have also looked at the Indian Penal Code. Uh, I think the 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 ground rule for any definition of fraud is that there must be an intent. There has to be a mens rea, an intent to be fraud. Where I think there's a little bit of variance is whether even acts of omission can be counted as fraud or not. And in that, you'll find that the standards are different across various statutes. Under the Companies Act, it seems to suggest um, that in case you were aware of certain you know, uh, uh, going on and you were a silent bystander or spectator, the way Companies Act fraud is defined, one could take the view that it, even omission is included. And the same goes for uh, under the securities market laws when it comes to um, abuse and, and, and fraud. The only exception is the Contract Act and the Penal Code, where there needs to be an act of, of commission as opposed to even omission. So the standard, as I said, is, is difficult to crystallize. Um, I would assume that the civil law standard uh, and even in the civil law standard, the companies, the contract act standard will not apply. And the, the standard under SEBI laws and, and companies act will apply, which means even a, an act of omission may be sufficient for it to constitute a fraud as long as intent is there. But that still doesn't help us get over the uh, obstacle of proving intent because that's a question of evidence. And um, I'm, I'm not sure, Professor Felix, maybe you can chip in for a few seconds, but under in, in India, the forum for bankruptcy is the National Company Law Tribunal, the NCLT. And the NCLT is not really, it's a tribunal, it's a creature of statute. I don't think it has the powers to look at evidence and have cross-examination and so on. Um, so proving fraud becomes very circumstantial and it's merely on the basis of pleadings. And in my personal view, I think it's a question of time before somebody challenges the constitutionality of uh, this section, section 661, which talks about fraud. Uh, but I think that's still uh, far away. So in the absence of any clarity, I, I think there is enough case law from Supreme Court to say that we can look to UK case law as, as having persuasive value. So I think that's what we will be doing. Um, but very briefly on the standard when it comes to wrongful trading. Yeah, I mean, is it mere first sign of financial distress or should it be a hopeless case where the ship is sinking? That's a very broad spectrum. And the um, protection, which is uh, there in section 66.2, it says that did the directors exercise reasonable diligence in mitigating losses? And what is the standard of diligence? It says that if another person, reasonable director in the same spot would have done something similar. Now, this is notably different from the exception carved out under UK Insolvency Act, under section 214, I believe. Because there, there is a subjective and an objective test. The objective test is that did you exercise diligence with the same degree of knowledge that another director in the same position or a reasonable person would have exercised? And number two, did you have the general knowledge or you will be judged against the general knowledge, skill and experience that that particular director have possesses? So it's both a subjective and an objective test uh, for the carve out against wrongful trading. Whereas in India, it's, it's merely uh, an objective test. Now, I confess, I'm not sure whether that makes it more lenient or less lenient, because if it's a subjective test, then I guess it, it, it comes down to your particular knowledge, expertise, and experience, and that could vary. Um, the second point I want to make is when it comes to wrongful trading, as to what do you take a proxy for inevitability of insolvency? There are a few other legislations which make it mandatory, for example, if it's a listed company. For a listed company, Jurist in the stock exchanges, there are mandatory disclosure rules. When certain events take place, those need to be disclosed. And those events include any default in payment of your interest on your loans, any default in payment of coupons on your, on your bonds, any default in paying any statutory dues or statutory liabilities. Um, all in case you receive a termination notice from or a recall notice from a lender, or you enter into any restructuring, in all of these events. It is an event which needs to be disclosed publicly on the stock exchange. Now, it's not been tested yet, but one could take a view that that is the starting point, if not the end point, for directors to get worried. 
that is this the time now where we start considering whether we have uh, tipped over the cliff or there's still chance of recovering from where we are and saving the company. And this, in my view, puts the directors in a very difficult dilemma because on one hand, it's the easiest thing for them to throw in the towel and try with the, as I said, try to obtain shareholder resolution and file for bankruptcy. And on the other hand, take all possible steps to mitigate the event of insolvency. And, you know, and that could be various steps. Uh, and this is something which we always advise our clients because our clients always come back and ask us, this sounds very good theoretically, but what does it entail? What do we do? I'm a director of a large company. I'm in the twilight zone. How do I mitigate losses for towards creditors? And how do I demonstrate diligence? So there are some practical tips that, you know, which have evolved in the market. Um, so for example, you could hire an external advisor an external commercial advisor or a, or a restructuring advisor who advises you on what the possible next steps could be. You consider restructuring your, your, your debt in a certain manner. You could consider taking business decisions such as selling off your non-core assets. So as long as the directors are able to show that they considered all these options, they hired an expert, independent third-party consultant who knows the industry, who's a financial advisor, who knows the economy, and on that basis, he has taken, the director has taken certain steps. I feel that that may be sufficient to show that we have taken adequate diligence. But again, it remains untested, unfortunately. Right, right, right. Uh, thank you so much for discussing the potential consequences for directors found guilty for breaching their duties. Now, let's examine the uh, guardrails or safeguards uh, available to these uh, directors so that they can avoid or escape liability. Uh, these can be both general and uh, statutory. Uh, for the benefit of our audience, I'll just explain the general safeguards like the business judgment rule. We also have a question on that. Uh, so it's a legal precept that presumes directors act uh, in the company's best interest. And uh, this rule uh, helps directors avoid prosecution for the only decisions they make on behalf of the company. There is another principle which is uh, known as the trust fund doctrine. So, according to this doctrine, a company's assets are held in trust for the benefit of creditors, and directors are prohibited from disposing of them in a way that compromises creditors' rights. So, Felix, does the uh, Insolvency Act 1986 uh, recognize uh, these two uh, legal precepts, the business judgment rule and the trust fund doctrine? And also, are there any other statutory guardrails available to directors? Yeah, so thank you very much. So generally, I, I, I think I can say that um, that English law does not directly apply the business judgment rule. It doesn't apply it um, generally in, you know, under the Companies Act and it doesn't apply it in insolvency. However, the rules and principles sometimes lead to similar outcomes. And um, just, you know, starting explaining this um, when we look at wrongful trading. So, you know, what are the what are the defenses that a director could ra ra raise under, um, you know, uh, Section 214? And there, uh, you know, in particular, we have to look into Section 214, Subsection 3 uh, of the Insolvency Act, where we can read that the court shall not make a declaration with respect to any person if it is satisfied uh, that that person took every step with a view to minimizing the potential loss to the company's creditors, uh, as on the assumption that he had knowledge of the matter mentioned in subsection 2b, that is, the, the point of no return has been reached, he ought to have taken. So taking every step with a view to minimizing the potential loss to the company, that is not a business judgment rule. However, it allows the director to argue that what they did was actually in the, the creator's interest. And Suharsh has already mentioned the dilemma that then arises because, um, you know, it, it is not necessarily the right thing just to wind up the company. So, you know, other jurisdictions are much clearer. You know, if you refer to German law, German law says, well, as a director, if the company is insolvent, you've got to file for insolvency. Very clear rule. There's no alternative. You've got to go to court and start an insolvency proceeding. That is not the case under Section 214. Instead, you have to think about what would be in the best interests of the creditors now. And sometimes 
that can mean continuing to trade. And there are, for example, cases where you know the smaller companies and the, the, there was fruit that needed to be sold very quickly, and the court said it was the right thing to you know go to market and sell those fruits because otherwise that they would would have been uh, lost and deteriorated, and and assets would have been lost. Um, now, um, what is the standard that applies? It is in, in essence a negligence standard. So you know the the standard that the, the director is is judged with is is one of applying the skill and experience and the care that uh, a good director in that position should usually apply. And interestingly, you know, just going back into uh, legislative history a bit, it was first in the Insolvency Act that the idea of negligence kind of found an introduction for director's duties in English law and later that then was transferred to the Companies Act. Um, with the Sequana duty, I also wanted to mention uh, that that duty, interestingly, had been developed in the 1980s against a background also of an inability of shareholders to ratify breaches of directors' duties. Because in the general concept, you know, uh, as long as there is no um, wrongful trading triggered, shareholders and directors may argue that, well, there was a breach of a directors' duties, but you know, generally, shareholders can ratify breaches. And so the question had arisen whether shareholders could just ratify breaches of the common law duty of directors to take into uh, account uh, creditors' interests. And as a result, there would never be any liability. But the court held that that is not possible. So the sequana, or at the time it was called the Westmercia duty, is not just a duty on directors. It also comes with an inability of shareholders to ratify certain acts. And that is quite interesting because it also imposes a limit, a, a constraint on shareholders. Right, right. Thank you, Felix. Uh, so first, what legal defenses uh, are available to directors under the IBC? And are there any specific uh, policy measures or best practices that you would like to propose to minimize liability risks for the directors? I think as a starting point, given the, the way our law is, uh, in the past seven years, at least I have not seen a single case where a director has been found guilty of wrongful trading. So I think directors are quite safe, they need not worry. Uh, and having said that, we do get calls very often from uh, especially directors of listed companies on how to mitigate losses. And as I mentioned, there are two or three rules of thumb that we have. Number one is the business judgment rule. Of course, it's a it's a very Delaware law principle, which uh, has not really been codified in India. But as long as the the directors can show that these were actions taken in good faith for uh, trying to revive the company, or they were actions taken in good faith for the purpose of you know reducing the debt or having of non core assets or whatever the, the precise business decision may be, as long as it was exercised with due care, with proper proper professional and possibly external advice, and you have ticked all the boxes internally, um, I think the courts will take a more favorable view of it. What we have unfortunately seen is a couple of cases where the directors have been found uh, guilty of fraudulent trading by the NCLT. But there, unfortunately, the NCLT has conflated fraudulent trading with preferential transactions or undervalued transactions. Uh, because when it comes to preference or undervalue, there is no need to display an element of intent. It's a pure economic test. Right? Uh, in one of the cases I reviewed before our session, NCLT found directors guilty of fraud, but they were not able to show actual uh, intent. And they merely relied on the fact that these actions of undervalued transactions or preferential transactions, they look very egregious. And therefore, they must have been fraudulent intent, as opposed to showing intent through, you know, through evidence. Um, so, as far as fraud is concerned, I think there is no antidote to fraud. But when it comes to wrongful trading, um, acting in good faith and making sure that all your decisions are are backed by proper reasoning, are minuted in the board minutes, disclosed to the shareholders wherever appropriate, would go a long way in protecting. And secondly, of course, as I said, the standard of uh, exercising diligence 
under Indian law is that of uh, a reasonably prudent director in the same place, what he would have or she would have done. Um, other than that, you know, I, I can't think of any further guardrails. Though I do wonder, and I confess I don't have an answer, is whether director and officer uh, insurance and liability insurance, how that has evolved in India in the past six, seven years. Because often those insurance policies would carve out fraud. But when, or, you know, but we're talking about fraud in the context of the IDC, where the threshold put is, is very low and does not necessarily mean an act of commission. I wonder if, if insurance policy are evolved to that stage where they offer some degree of protection to, to uh, directors. Because also bear in mind that the premium for such insurance policies is also paid by the company itself. So there is an element of, of self-dealing over there. So I'm not sure how that has evolved. But uh, maybe, Professor Felix, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping in if you could enlighten us in case you have any uh, thoughts on that. And so just to say, um, first of all, you know, um, there was a, a question in the chat whether um, the you know ruling produced marketing consortium 1989 still applies for wrongful trading in, in the UK. And yes, the, the answer is, is yes. The, the case law on wrongful trading has been quite stable. There have been things that have been clarified, for example, you know, how the, the damage is to be calculated. But overall, uh, you know, since the 1980s, when the, the, the rule was created, in the in, in the insolvency act um the, the case law is, is quite stable and so that is, is still good law and and also shuhaj many many thanks for the actually you raised two questions one was you know the problem of proving fraud and and i think that is a problem really um you know transnationally um what what of course what can help is that the insolvency practitioner coming in and then um enforcing uh, the rule has access to the uh, documents and, and, and the data of the company. So that, that may help. Sometimes in the UK, what also helps is what we will speak about soon is that if there, if there are, if the insolvency service uh, investigates the company for breaches, that it can also help to discover fraud. But of course, the problem is always that it is the insolvency uh, practitioner's onus to prove fraud um, that, um, um, uh, that, that, that makes it difficult. Now, in terms of uh, DNO insurances, um, uh, Shuhaj, um, what you've mentioned, of course, is really relevant all around the world. That you know, fraud is carved out, and so sometimes that that even then you know encourages those actually bringing actions to not claim fraud, but actually to claim just negligence, because usually you know directors quite often are bankrupt themselves if their if their company is is, is insolvent. So. Um, you don't you don't want to actually um, claim fraud. Um, instead, you want to then just claim claim negligence. Um, and um, so I've seen you know interestingly you know markets DNO markets being quite uh, quite different all around the world as as regards insolvency related DNO insurance. Um, but um, I mean, generally, in in more advanced legal orders, that is that is available, and it's a good thing that such D, such DNO insurance generally is available. Of course, um, George, you're absolutely right to say that there's an element of self, you know, dealing where the companies pays uh, pays the premiums for uh, for such insurance. Thank you, Professor. Oh. Uh, so, I have this question. So, uh, you talked about the director and uh, officer liability insurance, but how would this play out? Should uh, Do we need a separate chapter in the code or do we need a separate law for this? And also, uh, uh, I mean, we want to introduce some dead risk measures. So, do you think that this uh, goes against uh, all these dead risk measures because now the directors will feel that they are indemnified? So, they can do whatever they want to do. So, I I think the insurance cannot be legislated on. It's uh, more contractual in nature. And uh, you'll find that most large companies, even privately held large companies, forget listed companies, but even privately held large companies, they do have DNO insurance. And that's something which is generally approved by the shareholders and approved by the board. Uh, because it's it just makes more sense from a from an individual's perspective to have DNO insurance in place. I don't think that that, that can be codified or legislated on. Uh, but does that create sort of a perverse incentive to act in a more reckless manner? Uh, if, if that is the question, um, then I would, I would say that, that it, it cuts both ways. If I, the way I would read it 
is that it gives directors a longer rope to act in a manner which they which is a little more uh, commercial um, and take a greater degree of risk to revive the company or save the company which is on the verge of bankruptcy um, but i agree i mean there's a perverse incentive of uh, you know being reckless and not caring about the decision that they are taking but it, it i guess it's it's it depends on the person that that you are referring to and I, in my personal experience having dealt with many of the directors who often ask these questions with the comfort of dno insurance i have found that they act in a more bona fide manner and they are able to take certain risks to save the company which in ordinary course they would not have taken so i personally believe that dno insurance is actually beneficial i mean of course they have to be certain safeguards in dno insurance primarily as professor pulik said you cannot protect against fraud uh but if the company is is negotiating it um in in a commercial manner and in a prudent manner the fine print of the dno insurance i guess is very important but as a concept i'm in favor of it and i think overall it will have the effect of reducing business failure rather than incentivizing the directors to act more recklessly right right thank you i am also talking about the deterrence measures this brings us to this brings us to the last segment of the webinar so we just discuss as the consequences of the avoidable transactions regime under the ibc are restricted to the imposition of civil liabilities on the directors now the question that demands our immediate attention is does the imposition of civil liability constitute a credible deterrent or on its own or any other measures are also required in my opinion it is essential to impose suitable penalties on those who engage in reckless decision making one such penalty can be disqualifying a person from acting as a director interestingly unlike india directors are subject to disqualification orders for their culpable behavior in the united kingdom so i would like to know from felix uh, does this qualification serve as a as an effective remedy to prevent the abuse of privilege and does it also ensure uh, commercial probity Yeah, thank you, Dutch. Um, so, just to explain the um, the you know rules applying for director's disqualification, and then I'd like to you know I'll, I'll give you some uh, statistics um, you know to explore how relevant they are. So, first of all, you know there is uh, a separate act on this, and this is the Company Directors Disqualification Act, nineteen eighty six, the CDDA, and here the idea was that if people have proven to be such bad directors that essentially we need to take away the license from them it's like taking away your driver's license if you're a bad driver you take away the license to be a director then under this act they can be disqualified and the disqualification can um, last up to 15 years and if you're disqualified it means that you're not allowed to be a director of a company with limited liability now disqualification can happen in two ways either a court orders disqualification or you yourself you know being uh, contacted by the insolvency service who told, tells you you know we think you're subject to uh, an incoming disqualification you can make an give a, an undertaking and this under this disqualification undertaking um you submit to disqualification now usually you get a discount under such an undertaking and that is why in practice the disqualification undertakings uh, because you know your disqualification is a bit shorter uh, dominate so 90% of disqualifications in the uk are, are disqualification undertakings and only 10% are disqualification orders by courts now interestingly in recent times if you're disqualified now under section 15a of the cddda now also a compensation order can be made and that means that if there is a reason to disqualify you then now you can also be held liable if what you did uh, led to losses for uh, creditors uh, that was not in the law from the start but it is now in the law now what are the reasons for which you can be disqualified um one express reason is that if you engage in wrongful trading then that can lead to a disqualification uh, also if you engaged in undervalue or preferential transactions that means if you engaged in transactions that that are can be avoided uh, under the insolvency act but most importantly if you have proven to be unfit in the way that you dealt with the financial distress then that under section 
constitutes a ground for disqualification. And in practice, these are the majority of disqualifications. Now, here uh, are some statistics, and I have for you the most recent statistics for the year 2023-2024. So in that year, overall in the United Kingdom, there were 1,222 disqualifications, and the average length of a disqualification was 8.4 years. Now, most of these disqualifications, as mentioned, were for being unfit as a director under Section 6 of the company's uh, uh, director's disqualification. Qualification Act, and these were 1,162 disqualifications. Um, interesting interestingly, now, 831 disqualifications were for abuse of COVID-19 financial support schemes. So, um, you know, we see here a kind of COVID uh, still playing a, a large role because these are companies that essentially got money, which they should not have gotten, and, and abused uh, such support schemes. Um, also, it's important to know that if you are bankrupt, that is, that means if you are personally insolvent and you are under bankruptcy and debt relief restrictions order, you are also not allowed to become a director. So this happens when you become in, uh, personally bankrupt and you misbehave in your personal bankruptcy. But these are less relevant. So in, in the year we're looking at, uh, we only had 134 of such disqualifications. Now. Um, the numbers that we currently have in UK, you know, around 1,200 to 1,300 disqualifications per year uh, are quite stable. So this is also, these are also the numbers that applied, you know, in the decade before uh, COVID. Now, if you think about it, because you are uh, disqualified for a number of years, then these numbers add, add up. And so I was interested to look into statistics to find out how many people in the UK at any moment are actually disqualified uh, from being a director? And if we add up the numbers, then what it means that at any point in time in the UK, 8,000 people are not allowed to be a director under, uh, you know, of, of a limited liability company. Now, if you look into uh, sci um, scientific research on whether this is actually effective or not, opinions differ. Personally, I'm on the more positive side of evaluating these laws because I think that they that taking out some people from limited liability that have proven to be really dangerous for creditors does make sense. But I should say that there are others who question whether these uh, disqualifications are really effective. Um, now, disqualification, you know, just to end, is a protection for the future, while compensation is a is a protection you know, if you have suffered damage in the past. And, and so disqualification has a particular role to play here. Okay, thank you, Felix. Uh, so I have a similar question for you. Can a director disqualification system effectively deter misconduct by imposing reputational loss, or let's say career damage on delinquent directors? And if so, uh, yes, then how can a director a disqualification mechanism be incorporated under the IBC? So I, I think that's a that's a good idea, because um, as I said, unfortunately our NCLTs because of the bandwidth issues and because of um, in some cases even capacity issues, we have found that there's been not a single case under wrong portrayal. So the fact that it exists on the statute book is no longer a real deterrence, at least in the past six seven years. Therefore, there needs to be a greater deterrence, where directors will think twice even if they know that the prospect of uh, being found guilty or wrongful trading is low. If the consequence is, is high enough, then they may think twice. So I think that that's, that's certainly a good idea. Uh, under the bankruptcy code, there's already a disqualification under 29A if you've indulged in certain avoidable transactions. So in any event, you fall in that category. So a director slash promoter who uh, has been privy to avoidable, trans like avoidable transactions cannot be a bidder in an IBC process. But is that a disincentive which is big enough? Maybe not. So in addition to that, I think disqualification may not be a bad idea at all. Um, under the Companies Act, there are very specific grounds laid out for disqualification of directors. This may not be, uh, I think this would be another good addition in, in, in the list of disqualifications. And I guess the right forum would not be the bankruptcy court, but probably the Companies Act.
Thank you so much. Uh, can we move on to the Q&A session? Yes. Uh, so we'll take some questions from the audience. There are four questions. Uh, I think we have already answered two. Uh, one was, would coach apply the business judgment tool in wrongful trading cases? Our panelists have already answered this question. Uh, Felix has uh, answered this question regarding produce uh, marketing consortium limited case. Does the panel laid down still apply? We have two more questions as it's season out. One is from Deva Ranjan Goswami. Uh, he's asking till the time when Indian company is formally insolvent, it is governed by section 166 of the Companies Act, which does not mention duty towards creditors. In such a situation, how should director duty towards creditors be imposed in the vicinity of insolvency? That is when the company is not formally insolvent. So what would you like to answer this? No, I think um, business judgment rule will, will certainly go a long way uh, in, in, in protecting directors. But over and above that, if there is any sort of legislative intervention that is required or whether we can codify the BJR uh, into the bankruptcy code or not, I, I, I'm not sure if it's required because if you see the exception or the carve out, which is given to what is a standard of reasonable diligence, it clearly says that it reasonable diligence is, you know, if a director of a similar skill and experience and a reasonable director in a similar position, how he or she may have acted. So in some sense, the business judgment rule is indirectly codified, even though it's not as explicit as it is in the Delaware courts. Okay, right. right. thank you. Uh, there's one more question from Aditya Gupta. Uh, also, the four-stage test in extra short travel insurance is limited versus capital 2002. Is this the good standard to deal with corporate assets? Uh, I don't know how to deal with this one because uh, it's not very clear. So, Aditya, if you could just explain what is this uh, four-stage test is all about. Yeah, yeah. Thank I mean, I'm, ha I'm happy to, to comment briefly. Um, so, um, yeah. This case, uh, extra short travel insurance, was a case in which, um, you know, the court explored, um, you know, whether directors in exercising their powers in dealing with company assets would be in breach of their fiduciary duties, and it, it laid down a, a four-stage um, test. Um, you know, first stage, identify what what is what is the power um, wh whose exercise is in question. Uh, and, and then secondly, kind of stage stage two of the test, um, what is the purpose uh, for which such a, such a power has been um, attributed? Um, now then, um, stage three, what is the special purpose for which the power um, was in fact exercised? And then stage four, um, decide whether that purpose was was proper. Um, I, I'd say that um, that probably that is a, a more general. A uh, question that is, you know, can be relevant for financial distress, but need not be. And it, it, in in terms of English law, you know, just to allocate the question. So we are more looking at sections 171, section 172 here, and um, where also, you know, other case law comes in. So I would say scatter, scatter good. You know, the, the the case is just one of the cases that is relevant here. But you know, I I think the the, the, the core idea, you know, is 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 a proper one, and it, it and underlies um, many other uh, cases as well. Um, perhaps, if if I may add, you know, um, you know, uh, another consideration now that we've dealt with all, um, all, all the Q and A um, that we have um, is an issue that that uh, Shuhash has brought up, and that is, you know, to think about what economic patterns and what corporate patterns are relevant for how we design insolvency law. And, you know, sure, you've, you've mentioned that, you know, that that probably rules need to be different if there are more dispersed, held, dispersely held companies as opposed to, um, you know, more block holdings or more family holdings. And I want to give one example in, in how this um, can can play out and where we see also differences in in. In, you know, if we take a comparative perspective. So if we look at directors' duties and what they have to do in financial distress, you know, if they are dominant shareholders, then directors will usually be under higher pressure from these dominant shareholders. You know, if they're block shareholders, family shareholders, because they will tell them, look, you either you do what I say or you are out and someone, I'll appoint someone else and they will do what I say. Whereas if the shareholding is more dispersed, then 
um, you know, the directors might enjoy more freedom because there's no one really, you know, organizing this group to dominate them. And if we look into that, I think we find evidence for different policy approaches. So, uh, you know, the German jurisdiction is a, is a jurisdiction that also has more, more, uh, you know, less dispersed ownership and more block holdings. And that jurisdiction has reacted by imposing a duty on directors to file insolvency if certain financial thresholds are reached. And I think, you know, a, a possible reason for that may be uh, that then as a result, directors have such clear instructions from the law that the the block shareholders or the family shareholders cannot override them and tell them, no, you, you shouldn't go to court now. But but the law is very clear, whereas in more dispersed ownership, you know, uh, jurisdictions, um, you know, you, 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 a rule that is more open and, and tells the directors do what is now best in the interest of creditors may work better. And I'd, I would just like to say that I think both, you know, researchers and, and policymakers and practitioners are just starting to actually understand better the relationships between commercial patterns, econ economic patterns, and the way that we should regulate insolvency law. And this is a very exciting area to actually look at, because I think if we look at the discourse that we had on regulating financial distress, I think it has been dominated in the past for some by, by some selected best practices around the world. But there was the thinking that now everyone should do that. But actually, now we better understand we, that we need to look at the economies and their particularities and what matters there. And I think a particular other challenge that, that I see is that, you know, even if we start doing that, then an economy has very different types of companies. So, you know, there are small companies, one, two shareholders, you know, often they are also directors. And then we've got large firms. And, you know, how do we design rules such that in insolvency, such that they fit both types of companies? So we do not only have different patterns between jurisdictions, but we also have different types of companies within jurisdictions. And this is a very challenging thing to regulate and, and administrate. Right, right. Thank you, Felix. Well, we have another question, and I think this will be the last question. This question is from my colleague, uh, Faribul Kashyap. He says, as Suhar pointed out, Indian regime on avoidance transaction is fairly new and has not seen adequate success so far. And while there are judicial capacity issues within with Indian forums, uh, I would love to know from Felix, what can India learn from the UK experience on remedies to wrongful or fraudulent trading during insolvency? I, I, um, I'm just also reading the question. Um, um, so kind of that, that kind of speaks to the relationship between avoidance, transaction avoidance, so, Professor um, Felix, if I may, if I may try yeah, to, yeah, please, please, yeah, please, if please, I may please. try to paraphrase sorry, the question, yeah. and Parimal, let me know in case you know this is not the intended question. I think what Parimal's query is, how do you, very simply put, how do you explain the uh, the fact that there have been such few cases, uh, decided cases by NCNT when it yeah. comes to wrongful trading, and what has been the difference in approach, either in the statute or by judges in the UK, that you have at least a a body of case law. On these issues. Yeah, yeah. I, I think um, that gives me the opportunity to, to raise an issue that we have not yet addressed, and that is how are such um, how is such litigation financed? And we saw quite a, a, a relevant shift in litigation in the UK from when uh, third party litigation finance was allowed and assignment of claims was allowed. So perhaps I can explain that a bit. So. As a starting point, wrongful trading was um, was you know integrated in, in UK law in the mid of the 1980s, and then it took a long, long time until we, we saw cases, and then perhaps you know there was one or two reported cases per year, and I remember you know I I looked at the existing body of case law, um, you know around 2005, and at the time I you know I I made an effort and counted every single case and looked at every single case, and there were just like 15 successful cases reported, and and there were not many more um, uh, likely in practice. But then, um, and the reason was that at, at the time it was understood that the the right to bring a claim was a specific right of the insolvency practitioner, and the insolvency practitioner could not assign 
or get th assigned the claim and could not get third party funding for the claim because there was a kind of a general thinking that third party funding for litigation is a bad thing because it makes people fight more in court. And now that has changed. So now what insolvency practitioners can do, they can assign such a claim. So what they do is they essentially sell the claim. They find someone who says, okay, I'll buy your claim for wrongful trading, of course, you'll only get a discounted price because I'm not sure whether I will re recover the full sum that, that perhaps we will try in court. Um, but it, it it does two things. It gives, you know, it helps the insolvency practitioner to de-risk so they get immediate funds. And also it does a, a second thing, it speeds up insolvency proceedings because for creditors, it's not very helpful if insolvency proceedings take a, a very long time. And if you go into litigation about you know, wrongful trading, that that will take some time. Uh, the second thing is that um, uh, third party finance uh, uh, has been has been um, allowed. And now as a result of, the, I think, both of these uh, changes, we see more claims. Now, I think, you know, to end my, my answer on this, I think the real challenging question is to answer what the optimal level of litigation is that we would actually like to see in court, because that is not so easy to answer. Because, you know, some people may say, look, if there are not many ca uh, ca cases brought in court, then that actually means people follow the law. So that's a good thing. On the other hand, you know, probably in practice, we might we would probably say that wrongful trading is under litigated. And then the question is, is, is that a problem? And so I think the challenge that policymakers really have is to identify the optimal level of risk taking at what financial stage of the company. And I would argue that English law got it quite right. I mean, you can always improve things. You know, I'm, I'm not disputing that, you know, if you go into details. But, but I think the international trend was, for example, looking at Germany, who, who imposed liability on directors very quickly once a company was balance sheet insolvent, to actually reduce that, to give directors a time to try and work things out in the interest of the common good, because working things out would create more value than just winding up immediately, which happens if you force the company uh, you know, into an insolvency proceeding in which you know, the company will be wound up. So. There, there are various perspectives on this. And I think overall, we are probably lacking enough data and information to really make educated um, decisions on this. So again, I think there's, there's still actually on a very core issue of corporate insolvency law, there is still a lot to be done, I would say. Right, thank you, Felix, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for taking the time out. Felix and Subhash and providing us with invaluable insights into this topic. I'm very grateful to all our attendees. Thank you so much for attending this session. Uh, we look forward to having many more discussions on many more interesting facets of corporate law in the future. Uh, and please note that this session will be uploaded on YouTube very soon. So thank you so much once again. A big thank you to all of you. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Suwash. It was a great pleasure really discussing these things with you. And also many thanks to the audience and the questions that you've brought into the forum. It was, it was a great, great pleasure. Thank you very much. The preparation from the VD Center was really excellent. So it was one of the best preparations I've ever experienced in my life. So this was really, really great pleasure. Uh, I, 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 I echo, I echo Professor Phyllis's uh, uh, comments. Um, I, I didn't have to do much. Okay. Thankfully, Doug shut down all the homework for, for me at least. So thank you for that. And thank you to Vidhi for uh, inviting me. And uh, Professor Felix, again, I reiterate, real honor to be on the same platform as you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for being so generous. Thank you. Bye bye.